is of particular importance is it's going to examine the ways to educate and prepare future and current practitioners to integrate research into real practice settings, considering all of the challenges that we face and discuss up to this point. So I'd like to invite my, my good colleague and, and friend, Dr. Robbins, to introduce our speakers. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, the topic obviously is preparing current and future practitioners to integrate research into their practice setting, and the title speaks for itself, so I'm not going to tell you more about the paper. Bruce will talk about that. Um, I was honored to be asked to moderate this panel of these very distinguished people. Uh, in the introductions, if I spent time telling you about their publications and their research grants, it would take the entire hour and 15 minutes, so I'm not going to do that. Speaking today, I'm um, giving the paper is Dr. Bruce Steyer. He's a professor and former dean of the social work program at Florida State University. In addition to his academic credentials, he holds practice credentials as an LCSW, which you'll know what that means, and also as a board certified behavior analyst. Dr. Flyer is the founding and current editor of Research on Social Work Practice, which has the highest impact factor of all true social work journals. I'm going to ask you what that means, true social work journals for 2011. On our panel today is from the left, Dr. Patrick Bordnick, who we lovingly call Spike because of his hair, and is distinguishing from the other Patrick, who's on our faculty. He is a professor and associate dean of research here at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. He's a behavioral scientist. Human computer interactionary, interaction visionary. I like that. I love that title. He's a research artist and photographer. He has over 18 years' experience in clinical and laboratory research on substance addiction. During his career, he has developed research centers not only here at the University of Houston, but also in Georgia. Dr. Eileen Gambrill is a Kudo Patterson Professor of Child and Family Studies at the School of Social Welfare at UC Berkeley, where she teaches both research and practice. Her research interests include professional decision-making, evidence-informed practice, and the role of critical thinking within this. Also, propaganda in the helping profession and its harmful effects and the ethics of helping. And finally, Sitting over here is Dr. Aaron Shlonsky, who is, congratulations by the way, on your new job, who is the incoming professor of evidence informed practice at the University of Melbourne Department of Social Work beginning in July. He is currently an associate professor and the factor in Matosh, chair in child welfare at the University of Toronto, faculty of social work. He's also currently the director of the PhD program and scientific director of the Ontario Child Abuse and Neglect like Data System. In addition to his PhD in social welfare, he also holds a master's degree in public health. His professional interests center largely on child welfare and the use of evidence and practice. With that, please welcome Dr. Tyler. Good afternoon. Thank you all for staying here this afternoon. We practitioners are certainly earning our CEUs today, aren't we? <laughs> um, Emilio, could you check the lights to see if the uh, PowerPoint could be more visible if they were a bit different? Um, I'm a behavior analyst, and as such, I believe in using reward, and Alan Rubin has given me permission to tell you, if you stay through this presentation and stay awake, you will be buying drinks at the reception. <laughs> the topic I was asked to address preparing current and future practitioners to integrate research in real practice settings can be interpreted as involving at least two different tasks. One is to reinforce the use of the best quality evidence available by social work practitioners in the process of making decisions with clients regarding the assessment and intermittent methods they use. In other words, to promote the uptake of empirically based research knowledge by social work practitioners. A second meeting in my paper refers to promoting social work practitioners <coughs> design and conduct of original research in real practice settings. This is a very old issue for our field. Social worker Rona Levy wrote an article in 1981 titled On the Nature of the Clinical Research Gap, The Problem with Some Solutions. Obviously, her solutions didn't work out very well since we're still here. In 1992, the Columbia University School of Social Work presented a similar comment. 
Conference on the theme of research and practice bridging the gap. Um, I know Erwin Epstein was there. Anybody else back at that conference? Oh, good. So I can give the same paper today that I gave back then. Um, earlier this year, um, the Journal of Social Work Education published a similarly themed paper called Bridging the Gap Between Research, Evaluation, and Evidence-Based Practice by uh, Serena Davis and colleagues. Our disciplinary history suggests some reasons why this gap persists. For example, in the very first issue of the NASW's Journal of Social Work, Volume 1, Issue 1, two authors by the name of Preston and Mudd asserted that it's our conviction that the average social agent should not undertake research. And they also said that it is not feasible to conduct formal research in the run-of-the-mill social agency. And they went on to explain that the average MSW social worker is trained to work with people, not with abstract ideas, and that they possess an intuitive and artistic nature which does not lend itself to the neurological reasoning needed for undertaking social work research. This is our disciplinary flagship journal, first issue. More contemporary views uh, seem to support this contention. Just last month, uh, Alex Gitterman and Carolyn Knight published an article on Families and Society wherein they stated, this is a direct quote, evidence continues to suggest that practicing social workers lack the skills and expertise necessary to operate from an evidence-based foundation. We now find that our Council on Social Work Education has watered down its research standards to the point where Social workers are not expected to learn how to do research. They're expected to be consumers of research, to locate it, evaluate it, critically analyze it, and so forth. But the only research method they're actually supposed to learn to do is evaluation of practice. Well, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, but 55 years ago, it was claimed that MSW students were constitutionally ill disposed to be involved in research. And today, our CSW doesn't require them to learn about doing research except for evaluation. And we wonder why there's a gap. In acknowledging that there is indeed a gap between the assessment and intervention methods used in social work practice and what research has to say about these methods, the two meanings of my topic can be viewed as bridging the gap from different directions. Picture a partially completed bridge extending out over a valley. Over one end of the bridge, we have hardworking practitioners standing on the incompleted span, and at the other end, we have researchers. Many in each group are milling about aimlessly doing nothing. Others are nailing boards and being busy, trying to expend their end of the span outward towards their colleagues on the other side of the valley. But what they're building is flimsy and cannot support any weight. Some are consulting engineering science, designing high quality bridge and laying foundations and erecting strong girders, slowly extending outwards and closing the gap. But they're making hesitant progress and are impeded in their work by others who disagree with their philosophical assumptions, the basic design they're working for, and they're trying to dismantle what little progress is being made. Not that these people have any better ideas on how to build a sturdy bridge, merely that they're unhappy with the direction things are going. In fact, these people like the gap, and if anything, they wish to widen it, not close it. I assume that most of the people in this audience would like to close the gap to build a bridge so that two-way traffic between research and practice could flow more smoothly. I've devoted a considerable portion of my career towards integrating research and practice in both senses described above, encouraging practitioners to make greater use of research findings, and to encourage practitioners to engage in research in their own practice settings. I've also attempted to encourage academic researchers to engage in more practice-relevant research studies, and 23 years ago I founded the Journal of Research on Social Work Practice to further all these purposes. I'll review some ways that seem to have been successful in, in closing that gap, drawing upon some of my own experiences and those of some of my colleagues. Although our field has long exhorted social workers to rely upon the findings of social behavioral science, these exhortations alone, like New Year's resolutions, have not proven to be very effective. I won't read all these quotes, but I'll go back to the earliest one I could find from Arnold Twain in 1912, when he said, to make benevolence scientific is the great problem of the present age. We can jump ahead uh, 30 years to Bertha Cappen Reynolds, who said, the scientific approach to unsolved problems is the only one which contains any hope of dealing with the unknown. Well, she was no slouch. She was an important person in our field. Um, some more in recent decades, uh, concluding here with Alan Rubin. We need to test our noble intentions with research. The first reason is to be sure we are supporting something that's really helpful and not harmful. <clears throat> Over the past 30 years, there have been at least three distinct movements which have attempted to encourage practitioners to make greater use of research. The first of these, chronologically, is called empirical clinical practice, 
developed by social workers Shirley Jaratney and Rona Levy from the University of Michigan by their book with the same name, Empirical Clinical Practice. Influenced largely by the successes of behavior therapy, ECT focused on teaching social workers to evaluate their own practice outcomes using single subject designs and to preferentially select interventions from those that the research had previously shown to be helpful. This book stimulated a great deal of interest in writing in social work. It was reviewed in, in, by Bill Reed in 1994 and led in 1982 to the CSW including in its accreditation standards the mandate that students be taught research designs to evaluate their own practice. And that mandates with us to this day, more or less. A second development originated in psychology that is known as the Empirically Supported Treatments Initiative. A task force within the Division of Clinical Psychology, led by David Barlow, created um, what was charged with the task of coming up with some justifiable research standards which could be used to designate a given psychotherapy as empirically validated. With some acrimonious wrangling, this was done, and these standards appear in this table up here. Here they are. Um, for something to be called an empirically supported treatment or an empirically validated treatment, it had to be supported by at least two good randomized control trials where the designated intervention being tested was superior statistically to a placebo or to an established treatment. And then the experiments had to be done with treatment manuals. The characteristics of the clients had to be clearly described. And the effects must have been demonstrated by at least two different investigators or research teams. Um, with these standards in place, the task force began assembling lists of psychotherapies that met these standards. And um, this initiative is still alive today. It's now called Research Supported Treatments, and it has a website. And um, it's sort of there, but it's, it's, it's not doing too much. Um, there are many problems with having lists of empirically supported treatments. One is the file door problem. If negative studies tend to not be published, that, that, that biases the existing uh, pool of publications out there. Uh, funders may suppress or bury studies with negative results. Um, and basing a decision of support on a number of positive studies, they can end up not. If a, if a given intervention has two positive studies that meet the criteria, it would appear on the list. But it doesn't say anything, well, what are negative studies? In addition to the two positive ones, it would still make the list. Also, this list relies upon p-values, which says nothing about the impact or effectiveness of an intervention. And effect size has helped deal with that somewhat, but there's lots of problems with these lists of so-called uh, empirically supported treatments. The third development was an evidence-based practice. It originated amongst a group of physicians in the early 90s who wanted to place the routine practice of medical care on a sounder footing. They developed a five-step process model um, to help clinicians make decisions about the care of individual clients. Um, come up with an answerable question, track down the best evidence, critically appraise that, that evidence, integrate this critical appraisal with our clinical expertise and our clients' preferences, values, and circumstances, um, carry out the intervention, evaluate our effectiveness in doing so. Um, this is a process for helping us to make decisions. And if you ever have any doubts, what is evidence-based practice, it's this slide. And it comes directly from the book, Evidence-Based Medicine, which established the field. Um, Evidence-based practice in general, the model here, has rapidly sped across the human and health service fields where it's having a significant positive impact. The principles of EVP were introduced in the social work literature about 14 years ago by Eileen Gambrell in 1999 in a very nice article in Families and Society. This brings us full circle to the theme of bridging the gap. Evidence-based practice is a highly sophisticated practice model which is aimed at exactly that purpose, bridging the gap. I believe it's highly congruent with social work values and principles and the wish to promote social work practitioners consulting the available evidence and helping them to make important practice decisions with their clients, accurately teaching the evidence-based practice model is one very useful way to do that. Note that EBP is conceptually quite different from empirically supported treatment, and in fact, there's nothing in the evidence-based practice model that would lend itself to have anything called an evidence-based practice. If you consult the evidence-based practice literature, you will find no lists. The lists come from the EST movement, not evidence-based practice. The epitome of evidence in evidence-based practice is systematic reviews, previously mentioned by Joe Yaffe, 
published by the Cochrane and Campbell collaborations, very sophisticated, very methodologically rigorous summaries of the available evidence to deal with questions about the effectiveness of interventions, the reliability and validity of assessment methods, the etiology of conditions, psychiatric epidemiology, health epidemiology, and so forth. But the conclusions of systematic reviews don't tell you what to do. They simply say this, this intervention is supported, or it's not well supported, or there's no research on it, or something like that.